Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for coming out tonight to the launch of Being Numerous, Essays on Non-Fascist Life, published by Verso, um, and written by Natasha Leonard. Uh, <laughs> the inimitable Natasha Leonard. Um, and here to uh, pair with her um, is Rachel Rosenfeld, the founder of New Inquiry slash also Dark Inquiry. Um, yeah, so I'm going to hand it over to Rachel now. And thank you for coming out. Um, yes, thanks everyone for coming. And thank you, Verso, for hosting. Um, I guess this is the first, I, I, you had an event in DC already? No, that's coming on Tuesday. Okay, so this is the first event. Good, all right. Um, and I wanted to structure this event in such a way that it would just extract the most essential elements from the book and we can really get into the ideas and talk about it. Um, so we've, Tash and I worked on a sort of format where she'll be reading a bit throughout and talking a bit more about her book, extrapolating on these points. Um, so I want to hand the mic over to her to say a few words and then we'll just get started. Thank you, Rachel. And um, first of all, it's just an absolute delight to be doing this with Rachel, who I've known since at least 2011, and we used to live together. We're born on the same day, so it seems very fortuitous, and uh, I love her very much. But I, my biggest thank yous go to Verso, um, particularly Jake, Emily, Ben, who's maybe not here yet, Duncan, Mark, the entire copy department, the wonderful design. It's, it's really overwhelming, and I am obviously have been at Verso events since even before Occupy. Ha ha. Ha ha Stealing books then, so, you know, steal my book. Um, don't. Um, before, I, before, we jump, before we jump into the conversation, a couple of other things I want to mention, as you guys, many of you know, Chelsea Manning is still incarcerated for her um, righteous grand jury resistance um, and needs our support, as does her brilliant lawyer who is here tonight, Moira Meltzer Cohen. Um, uh, so if you look up actionnetwork.org and the Chelsea Manning Support Fund, anything you can do to help would be brilliant. Um, at the same time, uh, I write at some point in this essay about the um, Standing Rock protests and particularly about um, the, the, the small number of people that faced hefty felony charges. Five of them are still in prison. Um, so we, I want to give a shout out to them. And if you look up No Dapple Support Network and can also give what you can to that, that would mean a lot to me and them. And they were fighting for no less than water and life. Um, so I'm going to jump into what we discussed before, which is the question I usually get asked when um, journalists ask me about this book, uh, or just non-journalists too, partly given the title and also given the um, first essay in the collection, which is called We Anti-Fascists, um, which is, what do I mean by fascism? Um, and I use the word quite expansively um, without much fear of, of uh, overuse. Um, so I'm going to read a short um, mashup from that essay. So if some of it doesn't follow, you won't know if it's because the essay doesn't follow. You'll have to buy the book for that, or if it's because my mashup was bad. Um, so I'm going to start off with that, and then we're going to carry on our conversation. Um, oh, also shout out my mummy is here. Um, <laughs> up front. Um, and a big thank you to her for everything, and my partner, Lucas, and my little brother, Jamie. Um, we anti-fascists, jumping into the middle of the essay. Liberal appeals to truth will not break through a fascist epistemology of power and domination. It is this aspect of fascism that needs to be grasped to understand the necessity of Antifa's confrontational tactics. Neo-Nazi white supremacist groups, public figures, and in our case, presidents, are not the sum total of fascism. Even their total obliteration would not rid us of fascism. 
Rather, each is simply a dangerous locus of what I want to call fascistic habit, formed of fascistic desire to dominate, oppress, and obli obliterate the nameable other. I don't use the word habit lightly. I mean no less than the modes by which we live. Their fascism is not a perversion of our society's business as usual, but an outgrowth. I won't talk of neo-fascism any more than I will talk of neo-antifa. Fascism never disappeared to be revived anew. It simply reiterates, sometimes with greater force. Antifa, as I see it, is one aspect of a broader abolitionist project, which would see all racist policing, prisons, and oppressive hierarchies abolished. As Bertolt Brecht wrote in 1935, how can anyone tell the truth about fascism unless he is willing to speak out against capitalism, which brings it forth? Writing in 1933, Germany, Freudian acolyte Wilhelm Reich wrestled with the operations by which a society chooses fascism. He attempted to interrogate why a mass of people would choose their own oppression in an authoritarian system. He rejected narratives in which ignorant masses are duped or led into supporting a system they do not in fact want. Instead, he insisted, oh gosh, wrong order. <laughs> That's what mothers are for. <laughs> the work never stops. Um, that if we are to explain the rise of fascism, we must account for the fact that people en masse choose and desire fascism and we must understand that desire is genuine. Um, I'm interested in his observation that there is today not a single individual who does not have the elements of fascist feeling and thinking in his structure. The problem of everyday fascisms, micro-fascisms, with and by which we live is real and complicates the fascist anti-fascist dichotomy. There is a certain impossibility of anti-fascism as an identity. So if we are all somehow possessed of fascism in this sense, how can we speak of anti-fascism? How can we name and delineate the fascists of our political targeting? It is precisely through this recognition. We're not talking about some innate disease or pathology that we can't shake, but rather a perversion of desire produced through forms of life under capitalism and modernity, practices of authoritarianism, domination, exploitation that form us, such that we can't just decide our way out of them. But not everyone becomes a neo-Nazi. This too takes fascist practice, fascist habit, a nurturing and constant reaffirmation of that fascistic desire to oppress and live in an oppressive world. And to be sure, the world provides that pernicious affirmation, Donald Trump is president after all. Um. So uh, I think this is a provocative way to start the conversation because this is about anti-fascist life. Um, and I'd like if you could just speak more about, given, given that there's an impossibility of anti-fascism, uh, what does it look like to be anti-fascist? How can that meaningfully manifest itself? Um, so I can't give a kind of rules as rails answer to that. Um, certainly there is the kind of way in which we talk about Antifa and Antifa tactics. But the point of this essay collection, which only in one or two essays directly talks about that kind of confrontational protest, do I talk about what we might name Antifa? And I think partly the reason we all together settled on non-fascist as the subtitle um, is two things. I, I want to make sure people don't just think they're reading a book about Antifa. Um, there are better and brighter people who have written that history and that defense. My calling upon non-fascist um, does a couple of things. It, A, makes that distinction, and B, gives reference to um, the, where I first read it many years ago, even before Occupy in a reading group, uh, the introduction to Anti-Oedipus, Deleuze and Guattari's famous work written by Michel Foucault, and he uses that word. Um, 
in the context of talking about how we challenge everyday fascisms and the way in which we're overdetermined, overcategorized, the conditions of possibility for something we might say is uh, fascism. So I can't, I don't have kind of left-wing Peterson rules for life, although I wish, I mean, no one should set him as a fulcrum, obviously. Um, so I, I can't necessarily answer that, but what I try and do in this book um, without falling into nihilism is to suggest ways in which certain pathways are not useful. And particularly my um, antagonist, I suppose, would be the, the liberal center, which is essentially con conservative. It wants to conserve. It longs for the halcyon days of November the 7th, 2016. Um, so I want to make the point that while there is much that is slipping, getting worse, that we need to defend, the bastions and liberal institutions that claim to defend those things cannot do that alone. So we might need some illiberal interventions. Um, should I read this short part about... Yeah, I guess the... the right. You, you make this point about liberal appeals to truth being um, uh, inadequate to the problem and even exacerbating the problem. And um, I think the most controversial thing about your work is precisely this, this idea that li the liberal center is in many ways, the microfascism, maybe macrofascism that we live with every day. Um, so you have a section in your book about the rights discourse and the First Amendment, and I think that's where most of the controversy comes from. So I've asked you to, I've asked Natasha to put together as briefly as possible her best case for it. And um, I don't think I'm gonna ask a follow-up question. I kind of think the audience should think about your follow-up questions to this piece. Then we're going to move on and talk about other, other aspects of the book. Um, so again, because, you know, why not read something I already wrote so I don't have to make it up now? Um, I'm going to choose a, a bit of a mishmash of, of one of the essays, uh, which is called Know Your Rights, which was originally published in a kind of short form in the New Inquiry, founded by Rachel Rosenfeld, um, and then radically transformed and expanded for the book. Um, no rights. Uh, an over-reliance on the language of First Amendment rights treats the state as an interlocutor instead of an enemy. When we're forced to play the state's game, for example, if you're in court facing felony charges for protest activity, there's no avoiding state logic. The collapse of strategy, using a rights discourse in court into ideology, believing that defending our rights delivers real justice, recalls author activist Arundhati Roy's concern that we've swapped a grand pursuit of justice for the far smaller demand of human rights. Too often, Roy writes, these rights become the goal in itself. Human rights takes history out of justice. Reactionary state measures that abrogate individual rights produce a particular outrage from liberals, which takes the form of a certain shock. Time and again, since the beginning of the Trump presidency, I have seen political writers apoplectic over alleged rips in the social contract. They seem genuinely gobsmacked that the state can fall so far from its alleged foundation as a mutual agreement forged by the will of equal pledges. It's an almost childish dis disbelief, a well-meaning tantrum. A child sent to her room with no supper, you can't do this, I have rights, we had an agreement. As if any state were ever birthed through peaceful agreement and democratic harmony. Is this not the most violent myths of the constitutional republic, that it constitutes us equally? It's almost the liberal version of Make America Great Again, an appeal to a state formation and history that never was, when we focus too much on our rights to speak and assemble, beyond what is necessary when facing state charges and repression, our fight becomes atomized over the fact of, the fact of assembly rather than the reason for protest. And keep in mind, there's no right to punch a neo-Nazi. So. Um. The, so, I mean, you may have, you probably have questions for her about this, um, and I want to leave that to the audience and 
whatever to me discussion afterward. Um, but you know, on my as I was preparing for this event, is this okay? As I was preparing for this event, um, uh, I flew from Portland, Oregon, to be here tonight, and I wanted to do justice to the reason why Natasha asked me to host the launch of her book, which was a long time coming. And the answer is not because I'm this qualified person to talk about anti-fascism, although, you know, arguably, but um, it's because I'm her best friend and because we lived together for so many years. And as she said, we're born on the same day, poetic. And, um, and I lived with her through a lot of the pieces that she wrote that are collected in this book. Um, and I have this privileged access to an intimacy with Natasha that gives me a perspective of the heart behind the mind of the great Natasha Leonard. Um, and, and I've wondered throughout all these years and in the process of this book being edited, which was happening without me, I guess, of course, um, you know, how much others who read Natasha perceive uh, that thing about her that goes beyond what is threatening in her writing. Because I think her writing is, especially in the form of columns, which responds to the news of the day in its short form, what makes it notable, what makes it interesting, is, is how threatening it is to everything we hold dear. What Natasha's ideas are asking us to do is to turn away from the structures that effectively or emotionally hold us together as political people in America. The civic institutions that we are attached to, our habits of living, uh, are all things that are under attack in your book. I mean, in your book, yes, and in your writing altogether. Um, and that's very dramatic, um, and it's scary, um, and it takes up a lot of airtime when we're talking about Tasha's politics. Um, but it's an open question for me if, if in its decentralized form, in these articles and in these pieces, whether or not that body of work conveys to the reader that quality about Natasha that makes her so exceptional for everyone that knows her, which is the ability, I, I know no other way to describe it than the ability to give courage to those around her and um, that that she confers a form of courage in the way that she thinks about these ideas and the way that they link together um, that condition the possibility not just of turning away, but more of a turning towards something. Um, and so I think we're very lucky to have this book so wonderfully edited by Ben Maybe here at Verso and worked on by Natasha. Is Ben here, by the way, now? No. Oh, yeah. He's late. If he only knew how much we were talking about him. Um, I think we're really, truly, I think we're lucky that this book exists um, because it coheres her work through the lyricism of her prose, which can be often overlooked. Um, and as I read this book, I was stunned how beautiful it is to read. It is a beautiful book, but it also translates that ineffable Natasha Ness across it um, uh, and gives that quality of courage behind all of these propositions that are otherwise threatening. She, in the prose and as a person, encourages us to confront a terrifying proposition that we all be open to change and that we imagine that her commitments for a better world are ones that we can share with her. And so I've asked her to put together uh, some of the writing that I think kind of brings forward this lyricism that I don't imagine, or I, I don't know, I'm unsure what other book events are gonna be set up, but the sort of heart in, I think, a lot of her work, I want her to have some space and time to to speak to. So I'm giving the mic to Tash. She'll complete this reading and then we'll open up for questions. What an amazing hype person. I mean, 
Better than two chains, wow. Um, so I'm gonna read a bit about a ghost that does or does not live in my childhood bathroom because you'll have to figure out how it relates to anti-fascism, but I think we'll get there. Um, I don't see dead people, but a ghost has haunted the bathroom adjoined to my childhood bedroom for as long as I can remember, and it terrifies me. I don't believe in ghosts. I was around seven when my family moved to the leafy 1930s-style detached home in London. I don't trace the ghost back to that era or to any specific time. All I know was that he was there when or as I arrived. I've never been haunted, except metaphorically, anywhere else. Although I'm the only one who has experienced my bathroom ghost, he is not a private mental object. I don't believe in private mental objects. Shout out, it's, it's gendered because everything else is, so it's just interpolation. Um, I talk about the ghost now, joke about him. I'm telling you about my ghost because I don't really know how to tell about him. I point to him here because I can't, but I do. If he or anything were just a subjective phenomenological experience, we wouldn't be able to discuss it. Sure, you can't feel what it's like to be haunted by my ghost for me, but you also can't feel what it feels like to be me in general. That's not unique to haunting, and it is not a good enough reason to dismiss the ghost as just my imagination. Equally, if the ghost were just there, like standard issue worldly stuff, there'd be no grounds for comment, no reason to reach out and share him with you, it's his ambiguity that makes him worth mention. Intimacy lives in those places we don't reduce to the wholly explicable, even though we could. In affirming my ghost, I'm asking that we not be boring assholes about what gets to exist and how. The ghost invites an ethical consideration, not just an ontological one. He is indicative of inexplicable possibilities, which get ruled out as empirically impossible. We act better, I believe, when we don't work to fold every unusual phenomenon into our pre-existing precepts. It's a political imperative to believe, impossibly, that another world is possible, while necessarily being unable to explain that world from the confines of this one. The Inexpressible contained inexpressibly in the expressed, as Maggie Nelson summed up Wittgenstein's central concern. My bathroom ghost sits somewhere liminal in my web of belief. He's not part of how I typically navigate the world, which requires constant banal prediction. That it remains there, however, is ethically important. Your ghosts too, your demons, your holy visions don't need to exist. You could no doubt account for them scientifically. The bombastic tendency of Western science is to pathologize and then dismiss such things. But the question of what realities are possible should not just be answered by the measurable component of what already has been. Does maintaining the reality of your ghost hurt you or help you? Does a collective commitment to something mystical outside reason cause more harm than good? Bathroom ghost is a heuristic, which is not a metaphor, for considering what is desirable to allow into our worlds or to explain away. Because even though I could explain him away, he will still come and scare me. So I might as well make epistemic room for him. It's more interesting to do so. Ontologies are open ethical questions. We have to ask again and again. This is no more true of, say, religious ontological commitments than it is of the science, sciences which foolishly believe themselves to have escaped ideology. A few decades ago, there was a critical theory trend in making use of ghosts. Derrida introduced the idea of ontology, which just, if because he's French, it sounds like ontology, so... Brilliant. Um, as a radical critique to use temporality to challenge the limits of totalities and ideological dichotomies. Insofar as we always live with presence and non-presence, there are spirits. 
We see this clearly in fiction. All stories are ghost stories. A reading invokes a return for the first time in the present. Spectres of, say, a dead writer or an idea from the past. Derrida focused on the examples of Marx's specter of communism and Shakespeare's principal tragedy. Tenses are muddled. The time is out of joint, says Hamlet. These hauntings occupy an ambiguous ontology between life and death, presence and absence. Quote, they are always there, specters, even if they do not exist, even if they are no longer, even if they are not yet. Haunting is the state of proper being as such. Um, so if I'm talking about ghosts, and I'm going to bring us to a short passage from my introduction, um, there, is a, there is a ghost here tonight, hopefully, who is my friend Clark, who... Um, died just before the 2016 election, doing what he absolutely would have wanted to do, which is heading to Standing Rock to fight for water and life um, and indigenous rights. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'll read this and then we're done and we can have questions and then drinking. Um, I was attending a memorial in late 2016 the previous night, an old friend had been thrown from a car when, swerving to avoid a deer carcass, the vehicle flipped on a Wisconsin highway. He had been en route to join the protests against the Dakota Access Pipeline at Standing Rock in North Dakota. I met Clark in 2010, about a year after I'd moved to New York from London for graduate school. We were part of a book club called the Anti-State Communist Reading Group, or something to that dramatic effect. Old school who's here, yeah. <laughs> um, the friendships forged there became the foundation of an anarchist-leaning cadre which helped fuel Occupy Wall Street with radical leftist, sometimes blustery energy. Rakes in, beanstalk tall, mustachioed and grinning. Clark was a mischievous and above all generous activist. We were sick as thieves for a long time. Sorry for a long time, but drifted apart in the years before his death. No animosity, we chose different projects, different organizing spaces. Far left organizing in New York cleaved along ideological and personal lines. There's some of that in the book. Um, but the presence of Clark's absence, or his absent presence, was reason enough for a splintered scene to come together again that winter night in a community bookshop in Queens. Top us, check it out. Um, it was the evening of November the 8th, 2016. We weren't looking at our phones, and I didn't see the infographic maps of the United States turning red. Donald Trump took Indiana, Kentucky, Swing State, Ohio, and Battleground, Florida, before midnight Eastern time. We drank to our friend and lit candles, oblivious. We are pressed, pressed on each other. We will be told all at once of anything that happens. So wrote poet George Oppen in his 1968 work of Being Numerous, title, which is truer now thanks to techno capital than when the poem was written. But that night in the little bookshop, pressing together for those few hours, we were not told all at once of the results rolling in. I bring up election night here, my election night, shaped as it was by a very different kind of loss and haunting, to invoke the idea of accidents. In a sense, accidents are the proper subject of my book. I don't mean happenstances or missteps. Too many liberal commentators frame our current political moment as a baffling mistake, history taking a wrong turn. I mean accident as it was used by late theorist and urbanist Paul Virilio, the accident which is contained within and brought into the world by the inventions of progress which gets of progress which gets hailed as progress itself. Quote, when you invent the ship, you also invent the shipwreck. When you invent the plane, you also invent the plane crash. When you invent electricity, you invent electrocution. Virilio applied the concept of accident to technological advancements and its logic of acceleration. But the idea is useful broadly when looking at the operations through which society, selves, and power are produced and organized. For example, if the current growth of fascism is an accident, in a sense cribbed from Virilio, 
It is not because it is a diversion antithetical to liberal capitalism. The accident was baked into the context. This collection takes aim at how liberal capitalist ideology and its sometimes fanatical commitment to enlightenment promises fails to address its own potential accidents and limitations. It's a call for better weapons and an expansive understanding of the battlefield where oppressive systems hold territory in ever more brutal ways. I didn't begin the essays with the intention or even the idea of compiling them. That's the nature of recounting. Starting at the end, seeing patterns emerge, a thread of consistent argument and politics in work I've written as discrete pieces over the years on themes as varied as riots, political violence, the limits of rights, discourse, ghosts, sex, suicide, the state, and the self. That they come together is a happy accident, which is no coincidence at all. And just to end, um, before Clark died, he wrote a political call of sorts in a scribbled note, which his great friend read at his memorial that, that night. Live how we want to. Account for the real needs and desires while making a million and one sacrifices. Do anything for each other. Fight so hard that we don't feel as if we're going to explode all the time. Make that the great American pastime again. <laughs> so we're gonna open it up for questions. Um, but if you, if Jake wants to put the camera on me and Tash wants to hand me the book, <laughs> as, as a as a hype man, if, yeah. Now for sale at versobooks.com. Of being numerous. Okay. Um, so uh, how, how are we doing this? We're handing out a, oh, Jake. So Jake will come around and um, hand you a mic uh, if you want to raise your hand and have a question. We're going to take questions in stacks if there are a lot. So Jake's running the thing. Yeah, you just, you sit there and answer, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah, stack, please. Thanks. Hi, thank you. Um, I really like the book. And... Um, I want to know what you thought the role of joy was because you're, the content is very dark but it's also very celebratory and joyful and it seems like that's an important part of organizing. Um, so I wanted to know what you thought about that in terms of how it's a tool. Thank you and thank you Katie Helper who has an amazing radio show, please listen. Um, I, I like to think if we're talking, as so I mentioned in the first section of reading, the problem of, of fascist desires, right, and how they get fostered and fueled, um, what, and that they are kind of perverted and towards, and not in the fun way, towards these problems of, of oppression and domination and power. Um, so what would be the counterpoint if we're generating new desires? And I think that's what some of us have seen in, in, in movements we've been part of or observed, that living oppositionally to the status quo, but together and forging those new spaces and new ways of communicating, um, writing different scripts for how we can live, generates or at least aims and sometimes generates new desires. And therein, I mean, we might call it joy, even if it can be difficult and um, often kind of burnout ending. Um, I suppose jo joy would serve the role as the countervalent production of non-fascist desire. I think that the, if I may, that Clark's call to action to create the new American pastime as one in which we construct a life that makes us not mm. want to explode is, yeah. a good, is a good answer to that question. Yeah. And also, you know, uh, the readings I gave here tonight, um, you know, parts of the book do talk about the kind of more pragmatic nitty gritty of um, what sort of, yes, reform within the need for revolutionary vision, the sort of like practical reforms that we need um, that can spread more possibility of joy for people that otherwise 
have to struggle so hard that that wouldn't even be countenanced. Thank you, Tash. have been germinating with you and your writing and your should be, should be working okay it was a little loud before i know these ideas have been germinating in your life and your writing for quite a long time um but i'm i'm curious uh, you mentioned the election in the in the last piece you read uh would this is this book any different now that uh given the last election and that we do live under a seemingly more overtly uh, authoritarian and illiberal uh, regime, or is, do, do you want it to be received any differently than it would have if it was uh, published in a different, different time? I mean, I think it unavoidably has to kind of, even if some of the essays, and a number are, but not, I mean, a, a, a number were written long before even the idea of a President Trump went from being laughable, impossible joke to terrifyingly real. Um, but of course, the compilation happened post hoc, so unavoidably speaks to this con kind of context and will be read through this context. But why I think it necessarily speaks to this moment is in answer to some of the kind of, yeah, I will say like liberal centrist commentariat that offer really a kind of impoverished response to this moment by specifically drawing on histories and struggles and problems with the state that far predate Trump. So I think the fact that the work has been gestating for a long time is the answer to why it's relevant to bring it together now at a particular moment where political responses feel quite, especially in certain commentariat places, feel short-sighted. Hi, um, thanks to you both for this great event. Um, <clears throat> I guess I have a question, which is, um, if you have any advice for how we could talk to friends, family members, associates, whatever, strangers, uh, who want to vote for Joe Biden in the primary that is coming up, <laughs> you know? Because, yeah, this is the other, I mean, this is the equivalent, I mean, okay, so, like, it's, it seems like a lot of people want to vote for Biden because, like, oh, we can go back to a time when it was fine to ignore um, all of this stuff that you just described. And, and uh, there's this Biden as anesthetic, you know, and so it's, it seems, that doesn't seem that much less fascist than a right-wing Trump supporter. I mean, it, it's uh, maybe a little bit less, but it's it definitely, it seems fascist. Biden as the superhero who will take your conscience away. Anyway, what should we say to people like that who, and tell them to, to get them not to do it? Yeah, I mean, it's tricky, because God, what, like, uh, apologies for anyone who has to have that conversation. I certainly do. Um, because, yeah, it, it, it to whom are we speaking? Clearly, if someone feels that way, they may have not been paying attention or suffering personally during the Obama presidency, the Biden vice presidency, where it's not for no reason that the uprisings in Ferguson, Baltimore, the struggle for black life came into being, certainly not newly, but newly organized. Um, so the idea... What, what, I, what I do is point things like that out, like kind of material histories of the suffering that happened and continued to happen under that sort of neoliberal regime. And so that's, that's one way. Another way, so just literally pointing to their record. Another way is, is asking why people think we, we have this upsurgence of... Um, you know, post-fascism, kind of the pastiche of old fascism and new. That's a term coined by um, Enzo Traverso, another Verso book, which I've just been reading recently, which is excellent. We've got a problem of post-fascism, right? It's in the same way post-modernity doesn't mean modernity is over. It's still fascism, but it's this sort of ugly, new, pastiched. Um, so yes, I think pointing out their record, 
Um, and then also, you know what, if it's the kind of person that you, you're talking to them and you realize their interests are mainly preserving capital and their own and their kind of modes of living that they didn't suffer under kind of neoliberal democratic regimes and that they thought everything was fine because they had enough of a kind of cover to say, look, we're Democrats. Look, it's, it's Obama in the White House. So we're not bad people, but like, please don't touch my money. Like if you're talking to that kind of person, I don't know if you have to be that nice. Um, you know, changing their minds is not gonna change the world. Elevating the voices of people that were so consistently oppressed, that has got the goods and continues to get the goods. Um, we're just we're like we're oh gonna, okay okay just talking um all right my question is about um resisting the sort of appeal of anti-fascist spectacle which in itself becomes like really compelling mm. um and in a way a sort of like structures like oh like this is you know the guy who punched richard spencer and like the person who like you know, stop people in the, the sort of like iconography of anti-fascism, which is not the same as non-fascism, but like how, like it's really exciting when people are violent and um, humiliating towards the, towards, you know, fascist, you know, people and principles and like existences. Um, but it rallies us around um, spectacle rather than everyday life, which I think is what you're trying to I mean, like, just tell me why, like, really violent televised horror is, like, not the way to be anti-fascist, basically. I don't think it's not. <laughs> okay. I think, I think it's, a, I think it's a, a kind of one aspect in a multitude of necessary tactics, a diversity of tactics, if you will. Um, but I think, I think, you know, I, I don't have a problem with it being kind of memeified and mass projected when Richard Spencer gets punched. I think there's a kind right. of really uh, because I, I because I think it's a really valuable act in the general because creating material very unpleasant circumstances. But why for, hasn't it happened again? Why hasn't it happened again? Yeah. Because anti-fascist activists have been active so awesomely and so well in a diversity of ways, especially with relates to college campuses, that, so people saying these things don't work, Antifa got the goods because Richard Spencer made a video about how he has, for those who don't know, he's a neo-Nazi, um, a very famous neo-Nazi who got famously punched um, on YouTube. Um, but he, he said that the reason he cancelled his college tour was because Antifa was making it so difficult. So... So, like, thank you, thank you to those people who take that risk, which is a legal risk, which obviously any good organizer, and not everyone is, obviously, like, movements are themselves full of the kind of poisons that overcoat everyday life under capitalism. None of us are free from that just because we decide to be anti-fat activists. Um, but I think we've seen again and again that, like, there is actual value to confrontational even spectacular counter-violence to these underlying violences of neo-Nazis gathering. Um, that I, I entirely believe that's why certain assemblages of the alt-right are close to defunct, and we see that that is only the kind of tip of the iceberg of the white supremacist mountain that undergirds this country. But, so I think I'm fine with the spectacular violence, but but when the spectacle, it's a good question, um, but when the spectacle becomes all, which is so, there is that risk of that, um, and when we fetishize only that, that we create a couple of risks. So one is a certain mythology that gets missed. So for example, the very people that despise Antifa tactics because of the spectacle ignore the fact that one of the underlying tactics of non-violent principled civil disobedience was to bring the spectacle because it was well known that white supremacists and cops would react violently 
to nonviolent civil disobedience during the civil rights movement. So the, the presumption of the violent spectacle still, you know, informed and animated what is always kind of called upon as the ideal mode of protest by moderates who would have certainly hated what Martin Luther King was doing if they had been alive at that time. Um, they would have called it far too radical. So I think I don't want to say we get rid of the spectacle because it over-fetishizes a kind of limited, discrete moment of violence, but you know the way in which we build diversities of non-fascist spaces obviously can't rely on that. But I'm not trying to get rid of those. I'm, I'm into this. Look how much fun we had with that video. There's like all the different songs set to it. Just Google Richard Spencer Punch. You can have a Springsteen one. You can... video online of Nazis being punched. You can watch just a compilation of the cinematic history of Nazis being punched. It's, it's a thrilling adventure through cinema. Yeah, take that <laughs> Joy. Joy, right. then we're all going to have fun. And you can come up and ask me questions. You can email me. My name is my name at Gmail. My email is my name at Gmail. Um. So I guess following up on your response to that question and the practicality, the, the utility of this, this particular spectacle and the resistance of particularly of centrists or moderates to like, oh, you know, those are bad antifa tactics, you know, we should be peaceful and tolerant and and fascism will will exhaust itself by exposing its awfulness. Um, it feel I mean certainly say, you know, it feels like that is the dominant paradigm of say, you know, the New York Times op ed page. Um, Most of the time, yeah. Yeah, and not just them. Um, so, how, you know, how do we move, or, or can we move, I guess, from the margins of creating these joyful possibilities to, you know, becoming not just an alternative, but, I guess, a mainstream? I mean, I, that's it's like, like, unlikely. Um, but I think we've already seen in, in many ways the ways in which radical on the ground organizing or just kind of grassroots organizing that we can trace back over years, if not decades and centuries, has and continues to inform the mainstream of politics and debate. So yes, you're going to always have an intransigent conservative liberal who thinks they're on the right side of history only when it's in the past. Um, but, you know, for example, Elizabeth Warren calling for a cancellation of student debt, that would not have happened if off, like kind of within Occupy and then following it, the debt collective didn't organize around community-based debt cancellation. And you know, I'm so grateful for Astra Taylor and, and the group that did that and continues to do that. We wouldn't possibly have an Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. We wouldn't have an Ilan Omar if there hadn't been serious pushes from left grassroots organizing. Not that I think our only eyes on the prize should be electoral wins, and I think me, nine years ago, would even mentioning them would be shocked that I am. But I do think, you know, diversity of tactics. Um, but, so yeah, so things like, like that, I, I suppose. And same with Amazon HQ not, not actually being able to come to Queens, thank goodness, and like, thank you for the activists who do that, yeah. So, so you know, the, like, that, I mean, if, if our goal, or if there is a recognition that we do need some mainstream dials to shift leftwards, proof is in the pudding that it has to start on the streets and grassroots-wise, teacher strikes, sex worker organizing, like, that is not coming top down, it's informing 
elements of the top that would not have existed without that kind of organizing. Yeah, and I actually want to speak to, if I may, um, Tasha and I both teach, or I'm a founding faculty member, and Natasha now teaches at a program at the New School University called Creative Publishing and Critical Journalism, and some of our students are here tonight. Um, and um, one thing that um, at least I would teach about often was how webs of collective belief are formed and how you know, the project of New York City is to sort through paper in many ways and just sort of how do you kind of surface the book, the ideas that become the, the package that shows up on the bookshelves and is written about in the magazines and whatever and kind of like getting the discourse to normalize a discourse basically. Um, and that's, I mean, this is sort of a question. Oh uh, yeah, I also want to give credit for magazines like the New Inquiry that bought voices that now occasionally are the a few saving graces at places like the New York Times. That wouldn't have happened without magazines like the New Inquiry, without Verso taking on young writers, not just the kind of old guard of And the Verso left. offering their space for free. I just think this is like, the Verso loft is like shorthand for like, you know, like Brooklyn hipster, some whatever, I don't know. But like, what it really is, is it, it's, Things exist or don't exist in New York City by their ability to exist in space, because that is the commodity that is people are deprived of here. Um, there aren't spaces that are large that can hold a large group of people if you're not already having, if you're not already successful, if you don't already have access to that, you have a rich uncle with the loft apartment or whatever. Almost every night of the week, Verso is open to activists who organize in this space, and it's not primarily some hipster bullshit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Screw that New York man. Yeah. So article. and th so thank you to Verso. <laughs> thank you to Verso. <laughs> yeah. Verso. <laughs> Steal some Jesus. Um, but um, no, but I think. Sorry. Oh, should we do one more question? Oh, we do one. I, I, I was gonna make a. Oh no, no, make a point. Well, now I forgot my point. <laughs> I think Sorry. no, but I do think I do think that it's it is this um, that we do see the fruits of this change happening in the mainstream, and it does happen sort of like just the choice of one book publisher opening its space, some group of people starting a movement at Occupy that like these discourses get off the ground and have more power than I think we often give them credit for. One more. Natasha, you're so smart. Thank you for um, sharing your book with the world. And you obviously are not shy about making people very uncomfortable, but you're also very good at bringing people to the edge of outrage, but not letting them pop. So I wonder if you know that about yourself and if you have a formula, which is sort of like the question, like how do we talk to people who want to vote for Joe Biden and we don't mind making them angry or sad or uncomfortable, but uh, we do actually want them to think about what they're doing. It's tricky, and I actually don't have a formula. And like, actually, you can talk to my mum after the amount of like times I've not got that balance right. Um, not with her; she's brilliant. Um, but some of London's. Society would not like me so much. Um, but no, I, um, I don't have a formula. And I think the most important thing is to not worry so much about people who are invested in conserving power and property and capital being your interlocutors. Like, occasionally they will. And as I said before, like, re rely on the, like, wealth of knowledge and history of struggle to point out that they are not historically unique in their anxieties and their nebbish liberal concerns. Um, you know, it's, it's good to have some history on hand and some theory on hand. But m more to the point, like, talk to the people that are building movements and fighting and then you're not this lone lunatic. You're part of something. <laughs> Yeah, well, and and all, all Warren, I, I'm actually either way. Sorry, I think I think <laughs> like similar to Natasha's mother, who's here in the front row, which everyone should interrogate afterward, <laughs> having having watched her for many years up close. It's that Natasha's has sincere solidarity with the people she's talking to. She's walking, talking solidarity, 
and she's funny, and she brings humor to these conversations, and I think that there's a kindness in her heart that's true that is critical in having conversations that are very hard. But also you don't need to talk to your Republican yeah, also uncle. You don't have to do that either. <laughs> All right. With that, party. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel.